all predators have one thing in common, a keen desire to hunt. It's a powerful, inherited instinct. Birds of prey are predators, and they are superbly equipped to do the job. Their keen eyes spot prey as far as a quarter mile away. A strong hooked beak tears through flesh easily. And most of all, razor-sharp talons at the end of powerful feet seize and hold captured prey. It is this last weapon, their feet, that characterizes birds of prey. Birds that kill with their feet are called raptors. Eagles, owls, hawks, and falcons are all raptors. The power of raptors was recognized more than 2,000 years ago. Long before the invention of firearms, raptors were used as weapons to kill game for human consumption. Gradually, hunting as a necessity gave way to flying for fun. Falconry has a long and rich tradition in Europe, the Middle and Far East. This film is dedicated to the 2,500 men and women who fly raptors in the United States today in the ancient sport called falconry. Falconry refers to the unique hunting partnership between humans and raptors. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship based on trust and hard work. It takes one dedicated and patient falconer and one flying predator. Raptors seem to be born knowing what their feet and wings are for. It's perfectly natural. And a part of the predator-prey balance in nature for raptors to chase what runs or flies away from them. Much of the psychology of falconry is based on developing these instinctive traits. Most sports are easy to enter by taking lessons and buying the right kind of equipment. Falconry is more complicated. It is also very carefully regulated by state and federal laws. First, a two-year period of apprenticeship is required. A rigorous written test is the first hurdle for the apprentice falconer to pass. Then the proper facilities must be constructed. The Division of Wildlife inspects the facilities and equipment of every falconer to be sure the raptor will be cared for properly and safely. Hi, Kevin. Yeah. I'm Nicole Gillibert with the Department of Fish and Game. How are you doing today? Okay. I understand you're putting in an application to get a red-tailed hawk? Yes, I am. This will be your first time? Yeah. Great. Did you build the mews yourself? Yes. It, well, I had a little bit of help. Basically, what I'm looking for here in your mew is a good ground covering, the construction a covering to keep the bird out of the elements, rain, wind, sun, heat, um, a big enough area. I think your birds will be real happy here. I'd like to take a look now at your Jess's scales, all the rest of your equipment that you have. So why don't you show me what you have here? Okay, well, here's my glove. After passing the test and the inspection, the apprentice is ready for a raptor. Passing the written test was one thing. Gaining the bird's trust and acceptance, keeping it healthy and eager to fly, and getting it back again, those are the hard parts. Falconry birds are trained entirely by reward, using the animal's natural response to food. No punishment is used, nor is it effective. In fact, there is no realistic way to discipline a bird of prey. Hey, Ree, let's go, get up. Hey, Ree. Raptors have no desire to please their human companions. They definitely are not pets. A part of every raptor remains forever aloof, reserved, and somewhat wild. Given all this, how does one train a predator to hunt as part of a team? Wise falconers have observed that humans do not train raptors to hunt as much as they lead the birds to refine what they instinctively know. For his, or her, part, the falconer provides a carefully measured, nutritious diet 
to keep his raptor healthy. He knows his bird's best flying weight, and he plans enough flying time so his partner is in top condition. For its part, the falcon or hawk merely follows its natural predatory instinct to hunt. Every bird is different, just as every child is unique. Although there are many kinds of raptors, not all of them are used for falconry. Nearly a dozen different American species of hawks, accipiters, and falcons make good falconry birds. Eagles and owls are seldom used. Most apprentice falconers start with a red-tailed hawk, a common raptor in this country. Red-tailed hawks are taken from the wild. Trapping is done during fall migrations when young red-tails are a few months old and hunting on their own. Only young birds, easily identified by their immature plumage, can be taken from the wild. It is not legal to trap adult or breeding age birds of any kind for falconry. Some people might wonder if falconers threaten wild red tail or other raptor populations. The reason we allow the apprentices to take red tail hawks out of the wild is because there is enough of them. We do have the biologists doing counts to assure that the red tail hawk population uh, stays balanced in the wild. Other than the red tail hawk, the overwhelming majority of raptors used in falconry comes from private breeding projects, not from the wild. Every bird used in falconry carries an identification leg band. The number on the band enables the Division of Wildlife to keep detailed records throughout the life of the raptor. Falconry birds are fitted with slender leather straps known as jesses. Leather cuffs, like custom-made ankle bracelets, are used to hold the bird securely. When carrying the bird on the fist, the falconer places the jesses just so between the fingers. Traditionally, all falcons, and some hawks, are trained to accept a lightweight leather hood. The hood, carefully designed to fit the bird's head perfectly and without touching the eyes, is often a work of art. The purpose of the hood is to block out light. The effect is to quiet the bird and prevent unnecessary excitement or fear. Bareheaded falcons that are easily upset by automobile traffic or another bird so close, for example, are calm travelers once the hood is in place. Learning to hood a bird smoothly without disturbing it is an important skill for the apprentice falconer to master. The apprentice has much to learn. Okay, put your fist vertical. You take the bird, watch the tail. Put the leash between the thumb and the rest of the, there you go. Now wrap the leash. Only when he completes two full years of training and graduates to the level of general falconer can he think about other kinds of raptors to fly. Now the falconer can decide what flying style he prefers. There are two fundamentally different flight styles in falconry. In the first, the hawk is held on the falconer's glove fist and walked through the fields in search of prey. Jackrabbits and cottontails are typical quarry for hawks. At the first movement, usually before the falconer himself oh. fully recognizes yeah, the flush, go, go. the hawk's keen eyes spot the movement of quarry. Flying hard, the hawk tries to close the distance. If it can get close enough, its powerful talons will lock onto the prey with impressive force. Hawks are known for rapid pursuits and relatively short flights. Their success depends on quick acceleration, the power to grab with their feet, and the strength to hang on. Two hawks are used frequently in falconry. The first is the red tail hawk. The second hawk, the Harris hawk, has a devoted following in falconry. Of all the raptors used in falconry, it is the most cooperative. Accipiters are shy, forest-dwelling raptors. They're highly regarded by falconers for their incredibly fast response and impressive bursts of speed. The goshawk is the most popular accipiter used in falconry and hunts both jackrabbits and game birds. Medium-sized game birds and cottontails are suitable quarry for the quick cooper's hawk. The smallest accipiter, the sharp-shinned hawk, is ideally matched with small game birds. So the first group, 
the hawks and excipiters remain with a falconer until game is spotted. They pursue both mammals and birds. The remaining group of raptors, the falcons, are flown only at other birds, using a much different style or approach. Falcons are released to fly high overhead, waiting for their human partner to flush birds far below. Then the falcon drops suddenly in a fast dive, called a stoop, reaching speeds approximately 200 miles an hour. Once close enough to their target, falcons try to hit their quarry with their feet, either grabbing it mid-air or knocking it to the ground. Several kinds of falcons are used successfully. The classic falcon is the peregrine. Many people know how domestic breeding programs have brought the peregrine back from the edge of extinction. But few realize that falconers themselves led initial efforts and continue to support peregrine breeding and release projects. In fact, almost every falconry breeding project in the world was started or is run by falconers. As more and more peregrines are bred domestically, their use by American falconers grows. But before peregrine breeding projects were underway, the prairie falcon became an alternate favorite. Many falconers remain loyal to the prairie falcon today because of its fine flying style. The jeer falcon is not a common falconry bird in the lower 48 states because it thrives best in a cold climate. The jeer falcon is the most powerful falcon used in the sport. Merlins are small, quick falcons that provide plenty of action. The American kestrel, littlest of all North American falcons, commonly eats insects and very small prey and so it is not often used in falconry. It is not unusual for a serious falconer to gain experience with several different raptor species over a period of years. Most falconers work intensively with just one or two birds at a time. They do not have a stable full of birds to fly. In fact, the law prohibits having more than three birds at one time for even the most experienced falconer. There has been a mistaken belief that falconers and their birds threaten wild prey populations. The truth is that falconry represents no danger to wild prey populations, as biological studies confirm. We have regulations that the department puts out allowing the public to know exactly how many birds you can take during a certain season. The seasons and the amount of birds that are taken are through studies that the biologists do, so you're not taking the birds during breeding season, and they allow you to take the maximum amount without depleting the population for that year. Wild raptors often miss their prey, and so do falconry birds. For most falconers, the beauty and power of the flight are the incentives, not the number of game caught. Falconry has its share of heartaches. For all their fierce hunting instincts, raptors are rather fragile creatures. Disease can hit quickly, and like all predators, raptors can be injured. But unlike their wild cousins, falconry birds receive prompt medical attention. Okay, sweetie, are you gonna be okay with this? Let's find out. Her heart sounds fine and her air sacs are nice and clear and that's what we like to like to hear on her. And let's just have a feel of her joints right here and make sure that there's no swelling. Okay, Lynn, we're gonna start her off with an injection here and then you're gonna continue with the oral medication tonight. Now this is gonna go just in the breast muscle here. New medications are now available for certain avian diseases that are lethal if left untreated. Still, there are no guarantees. 
more often than one might think. Falconry birds are attacked by other raptors. This usually occurs just after the falcon or hawk has caught its prey and is most vulnerable on the ground. Wild red-tailed hawks, owls, and eagles often prey on falconry birds. Sometimes uh, your own bird can fall prey to larger raptors, uh, like the eagle or the red tail for a particular bird of this size. And it's only a natural prey selection uh, thing that's going on there. It's um, very disturbing for the falconer and his bird, obviously, but in the true sense of, of the environment, it's only something that goes on every day. Since falconry birds are flown free, there is always some risk of losing them. Some simply fly off and cannot be found again. A long chase after game or strong winds can carry a falcon a considerable distance. Most birds do not return to look for the falconer. If the bird is not located for more than 24 hours, the chances for retrieval are not good, although telemetry has made a considerable difference. Falconry birds lost overnight may themselves become prey. I'm getting a pretty good signal. I think she's probably in the trees. But most adjust quickly and continue to hunt on their own. Although there are potential dangers every time a falconer flies his raptor, they are accepted as risks associated with the sport. The falconer may never be able to forgive an eagle for attacking his favorite falcon, but he can understand that the same predatory instinct drives them both to hunt. Illegal human predators occupy a special category. These the falconer can neither forgive nor understand. No one who has spent hundreds of hours training, tending, and caring for a living thing is untouched by such a loss. When one loses a bird that he spent a lot of time training, you lose a part of yourself because a part of yourself goes into the training of that bird. Uh, if someone was to shoot my bird, it would be like you shot me. Many falconers deliberately return their wild-trapped red-tailed hawks back to the wild when the two-year apprenticeship is finished. After notifying the Division of Wildlife about the release, the falconer takes his hawk to good habitat, removes the leather jesses, and releases her for the last time. For the falconer, there are mixed feelings, but the red-tailed hawk, now a mature, healthy, and experienced flyer, reverts very quickly to the wild. Whatever the risks, and there are many, there are ample rewards in falconry, too. Uppermost is the satisfaction that comes from being close to a wild thing, not as its keeper, but as an equal partner, knowing that it can leave, but chooses to stay. The falcon has allowed a human to be a partner in the predator-prey relationship. <laughs>